a lot of attention at the moment focused on the United States because it's still the largest economy effectively and many people see that economy as the one needing to grow quickly in order to fuel this global recovery. But there are some experts who are not just cautiously optimistic who are saying the U.S. could actually seep into a double dip recession. Yeah, but uh, I think what people actually fail to realize is that uh, the probability of a double dip, according to our forecast, is only 20%. Mm -hmm. This is 20 out of, you know, out of 100. So the chances are very low, you know, in that sense. However, that's cause for concern, you know, in the sense that uh, the forecasts, you know, uh, previous forecasts were really looking at uh, a much faster growth rate, you know, in the United States than that we are experiencing right now. Uh, secondly, combined with that, Europe actually is slowing down. Uh, this Eurozone crisis uh, is uh, causing a lot of alarm uh, in Europe particularly. And uh, it may also have uh, some repercussions for the African economies. Okay. Let's continue to talk about the U.S. economy and just tell us what will inspire growth and what will constrain it? Because we've got expansion at 3% or just above 3%, but we've also got very high unemployment, 8 million Americans unemployed, and we've got companies not wanting to spend and credit flows very, very slow in the United States at the moment. So the various elements that would stimulate a more vibrant economy are not active. Well, uh, there is a debate going on right now in the United States, you know, about... Uh, the possibility of, of a second fiscal stimulus. Now, this is quite contrary to what is going on in Europe, for example. If you look right across Europe, they're cutting down on fiscal uh, spending. But uh, the United States is uh, actually looking at uh, um, another fiscal stimulus. I mean, this has been debated. Uh, there are certain elements within uh, the uh, government or between, within uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate, you know, that are. Uh, vehemently opposed to any mm. you know, fiscal, fiscal stimulus. But that would be one remedy that we want to approach. Now, interest rates, they're almost down to zero. That's just nothing you, know, you can do about that. Um, trying to give, uh, you know, uh, 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 make more credit available to small businesses, which uh, actually normally hire you know, quite a few people, would be one approach you know, as well. All right, let's talk about what you're raising, how Africa fares within this context. The IMF has estimated that on average, global growth would be about 4.5%, and many African economies are somewhere within that range. But the leading African economy is not within that range. South Africa expected to grow at best at about 3.2% this year. What is the broader Yeah, but again, let's look at South Africa this year. I mean, given that forecast and what happened in South Africa last year, I mean, growth rate was actually anemic last year. Now, looking at it from a regional perspective, if you want to look at it fairly cosmetically, I mean, uh, South Africa, the economy is about 40% of Africa GDP. So if uh, South Africa grows slower than the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, it pulls the average down. However, you want to look at individual economies, you know, and uh, how they fare within this uh, framework. What can actually be problematic, however, is that if South Africa slows down significantly. Let's say it slows down maybe as low as what happened last year. Remember South Africa is a significant mm. a significant foreign direct investor in the rest of Sub Saharan Africa. So that could have an impact. All right, let's talk about investment flows for instance, because earlier on when we were speaking with Ulrich he was referring to what available options there are for the Reserve Bank and how that will impact on capital flows. And this takes us to broader issues in Africa about currency stability and exchange rate regimes, which are seen to be an impediment in many ways to investments through equities and stock markets for one, and also in terms of foreign direct investment coming into other African economies. Your views? Well, if you look at... Uh, there are if you look, if, if you look at uh, the currency regimes within Africa, one block that stands out is the CFR zone. You know, these are uh, about 14 uh, uh, sub-Saharan African uh, currencies, mostly uh, in central and the West, central of West Africa, that are tied to the French, to the uh, to the to the euro. These were former French colonies. I mean, right now they also include Guinea-Bissau, which is which was a former Portuguese colony. It also includes. Uh, Equatorial Guinea, which was a Spanish colony. But uh, they had their 
currencies paid to the French franc and now to the euro. So there isn't really much they can do about it. Okay. Uh, in other words, they cannot unilaterally, they, once they pegged their currency, they had their currencies pegged to uh, the euro, they have totally you know, uh, 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 surrendered their monetary policy. So that's really much, that uh, that's not really much they can do. Now, for them, if for example, the euro depreciates vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, it has a very, very interesting uh, uh, impact. In fact, what may happen is the exports, especially their non-oil exports, that they have in common with certain countries in Latin America and Asia, okay, whose currencies may be more stable against the, against the greenback, they may develop a competitive advantage in some of those exports. This happened, if you look back in 1989, when the French franc they were paid to appreciated they also appreciate it not because of uh, uh, the, the, the conditions of their economies, but because of their, 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 their pegged to the French flag. So and a lot of them went into a recession. Countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, right. went into almost four years of negative growth. Or, or if just your point of view concerning what is needed to boost African exports, because that's really where we lose the competitive edge. We may have the goods that are on demand in the market, such as commodities, but we're not exporting the volumes that are necessary. Certainly that's the case in the South African situation. Yeah. Unfortunately, we look at, uh, first of all, you know, if we look at the South African situation, the strength of the rain. But uh, the other problem is, of course, if, you, if, if there's a lack of infrastructure, you have to be able to get your products to the markets as quickly as possible so that you have the competitive edge above the Brazilians mm -hmm. or the Australians. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is still some problem that we face in Africa to have the infrastructure to get these products to the markets, wherever these markets are. All right, we've got a commodities <coughs> dependency here. Right. And that's the constraint. Infrastructure right. is one of them. Right. Now, th th this is a very, uh, very, a very good point. Uh, and this is where the Chinese actually come into play. Yeah. This is why they become yeah. paramount you know, when you discuss uh, their economic you know, ventures. Uh, you know, into Africa, but Africa is commodity dependent. You know, commodity dependency, simple and straightforward. If the world economy or the economies that are significant on the demand side of the commodity equation go into a slowdown, commodity prices fall and Africa suffers right there. You know. All right, you mentioned China, and I think that's where we'll leave it with this conversation. A lot of things going on in China, um, their growth. Uh, forecast revised uh, downwards, but not, you know, but it's still a big number, 10.3 in the last quarter. But we've also seen in China wages going up, and that's impacted on the cost of manufacturing. That will impact on the cost of exported goods, and that will impact on Africa, which uh, really provides the commodities that China is looking for. So, as the number one trading partner of Africa, but with changing market conditions within. China, how's that going to impact on the cost? Well, you know, first of all, I mean, uh, if the cost of uh, production becomes more expensive in China, that may be a bonanza for Africa in the, in the sense that uh, China may end up relocating some of the small manufacturing processes into Africa. They're already doing this in Vietnam because the Vietnam now has a competitive labor cost advantage over China. As a result, China is actually moving some of its production mm -hmm. into Vietnam. Hopefully, a similar situation will develop uh, will develop, uh, I mean, uh, in Africa. 